Good evening. I'm Maya Shenwar, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Truthout. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for being here tonight. And a gigantic thank you to the Lannan Foundation, which does such crucial work, including their indispensable, absolutely, indispensable support for independent journalism. I'm really, really honored to be here with you in Santa Fe. I'm from Chicago, so it's always a treat to see mountains. In Chicago, we basically have one hill, and it's called Mount Trashmore <laughs> because it's a landfill. But I'm also very grateful to be here because I'm so excited to be interviewing my friend, the brilliant author and professor and cultural critic, Henry Giroux. I met Henry in 2008 when he started writing for Truth Out. At the very beginning, I wasn't sure how readers would respond to Henry's work. We weren't really in the habit of publishing academics, and many of our most popular stories at the time were about how George Bush was an idiot and how Dick Cheney was the devil. <laughs> but, when Henry's first couple of stories came out, I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, our website's top traffic was coming from stories by Henry about critical pedagogy and neoliberalism and the death of the social. Henry was even outranking stories about marijuana legalization, <laughs> and that was huge. <laughs> so why did everyone love Henry? I think this is why. Henry has a unique ability to make people care. Henry's public intellectual project, which is the section he founded on Truthout, links scholarly work with urgent social issues. This is the kind of project that Henry has carried out through his books and in his classroom for decades. It reaches beyond the abstract to say to large groups of people, this is about you. This is about your pain. This is about your community, your passions, and your struggles. Much of the emphasis of Henry's work is on education, but it's always education in a broad public sense both what is happening inside of our increasingly privatized schools and the kind of civic lessons that we all learn on a daily basis from the media and political culture and the commercials that we see on TV. Henry has an almost magical power to connect the dots. And partially, that means connecting the dots between schools and prisons and poverty and war and surveillance and austerity. And Henry does that beautifully. But he also connects the dots between politics and our lives. Part of why Henry has this unique ability to make people care or to show people that they care already is because he cares so deeply and authentically himself. Henry is not in it to be a famous academic. And in fact, he'll give you an earful about elite academia if you talk to him long enough. He's often mentioned that his politics grew out of his working class background and developed in opposition to the ruling class's dictates for the way his life should be led. When he talks about his moment of coming into critical class consciousness, he writes, I had to flip the script in order to survive. Henry is still flipping the script. And in Henry's script, it's not the individual, but the social that can transform this country and humanity. In discussing his childhood, Henry said once in an interview, 
One could not survive in that neighborhood without friends. Social justice for me was forged in the bonds of solidarity and the need to recognize some notion of the common good. Much of Henry's work concludes with a call to collective action, urging us all to live that solidarity ourselves. Now, in spite of his best efforts to not join the academic elite, Henry has acquired a long and impressive list of qualifications. He currently holds the Chair in Scholarship in the Public Interest at McMaster University. He has written more than 60 books, including Zombie Politics and Culture in the Age of Casino Capitalism and The Violence of Organized Forgetting, Thinking Beyond America's Disimagination Machine. Just recently, Henry was presented with the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Educational Research Association. I could go on and fill up the next hour with a list of Henry's award-winning books and accomplishments, but that wouldn't give us time to hear him talk, and I think that's really important. So please join me in welcoming the incredible Henry Giroux. What an honor to be here. This is like going to heaven. This is what every writer, every writer dreams about this sort of thing. I want to I want to thank the Lantern, the Lantern Foundation for inviting me. I mean, this foundation is a national treasure. And I And I think to be able to be part of that, you know, one can't be grateful enough. So let me begin. Following the insight of Hannah Harant, a leading political theorist of mid-20th century totalitarianism, a dark cloud of political and ethical ignorance has descended upon the United States. A primary condition of authoritarian rule, thoughtlessness, now occupies a privileged, if not celebrated, place in the political landscape and mainstream cultural apparatuses. A new kind of infantilism now shapes daily life as adults gleefully take on the role of unthinking children and children are pushed to be adults. Stripped of their innocence and subject to a range of disciplinary pressures that saddle them with debt and cripple their ability to be imaginative. Under such circumstances, agency devolves into a mind-numbing anti-intellectualism evident in the banalities produced by Fox News infotainment and celebrity culture, and in the blinding rage produced by populist politicians who support creationism, argue against climate change, and rail against immigration, the rights of women, public service workers, gays, and countless others. There is more at work here than a lethal form of intellectual, political, and emotional infantilism. There is the catastrophe of indifference and an inattentiveness to, the, to memory and critique that breeds horrors, flirtations with irrationality and the withering of political life. The citizen is now urged to become a consumer. Politicians are now mouthpieces for money and power, and the burgeoning army of anti-public intellectuals in the mainstream or corporate media present themselves as unapologetic enemies of compassion, the commons, and democracy itself. Education is no longer viewed as a public good, but a private right, just as critical thinking is devalued as a fundamental necessity for creating engaged and socially responsible citizens. Neoliberalism's contempt for the social is now matched by an utter disdain for the common good. Public spheres that once encouraged progressive ideas, enlightened social policies, democratic values, critical dialogue and exchange have been replaced by corporate entities whose ultimate fidelity is to increasing profit margins and producing a vast commercial culture that tends to function so as to erase everything that matters. <laughs> 
One outcome of this tangle of forces is that we live at a time in which institutions that were designed to limit human suffering and indignity and protect the public from the boom and bust cycles of capitalist markets have now been weakened or abolished. Free market, policy values, free market policies, values, and practices with their now unrestrained emphasis on the privatization of public wealth, the denigration of social protections, and the deregulation of economic activity influence practically every commanding political and economic institution in North America. Finance capitalism now drives politics, governance, and policy in unprecedented ways and is more than willing to sacrifice the future of young people for short-term political and economic gains. Given these conditions, an overwhelming catalog of evidence has come into view that indicates that nation states organized by neoliberal priorities have implicitly declared war on their children, offering a disturbing index of societies in the midst of a deep moral and political catastrophe. Far too many youth today live in an era of foreclosed hope, an era in which it's difficult to either imagine a life beyond the dictates of a market-driven society or to transcend the fear that any attempt to do so could only result in a more dreadful nightmare. As Jennifer Silva has pointed out, this generation of especially, quote, young working class men and women are trying to figure out what it means to be an adult in a world of disappearing jobs, soaring education costs, and shrinking support networks. They live at home longer, spend more years in college, change jobs more frequently, and start families later. Youth today are not only plagued by the fragility and uncertainty of the present, they are the first post-war generation facing the prospect of downward mobility, in which the plight of the outcast stretches to embrace a generation as a whole. It's little wonder that these youngsters are called Generation Zero, a generation with zero opportunities, zero futures, and zero expectations, or to use Guy Standing's term, the precariat, which he defines as a growing proportion of our total society forced to accept a life of unstable labor, labor and unstable living. Too many young people and other vulnerable groups now inhabit what might be called a geography of terminal exclusion, a space of disposability that extends its reach to a growing number of individuals and groups. The human face of those who inhabit this geography of exclusion has been captured in a story by Chip Ward, a former librarian in Salt Lake City who writes poignantly about a homeless woman. He is, he's named Ophelia, who retreats to the library because like many of the homeless, she has nowhere else to go to use the bathroom, secure temporary relief from bad weather, or simply be able to rest. Excluded from the American dream and treated as both expendable and a threat, Ophelia, in spite of her obvious mental illness, defines her own existence in terms that offer a kind of chilling metaphor for her own plight and those of many others. Ward describes Ophelia's presence and actions in the following way. He says, Ophelia sits by the fireplace and mumbles softly. Smiling and gesturing at no one in particular, she gazes out the large window through through the two pairs of glasses she wears, one windshield-sized pair over a smaller set perched precariously on her small nose. Perhaps four lenses help her see the invisible other she's addressing. When her nobody there conversation disturbs the reader beside her, Ophelia turns, chuckles at the woman's discomfort and explains, don't mind me, I'm dead. It's okay, I've been dead for some time now. She pauses and then adds reassuringly, it's not so bad, you get used to it. Not at all reassured, the woman gathers her belongings and moves quickly away. Ophelia shrugs. Verbal communication is tricky. She prefers telepathy. But that's hard to do since the rest of us, she informs me, don't know the rules. Ophelia represents just one of the 3.5 million people who are homeless at some point in the year in the United States. 
who now use public libraries and any other accessible public spaces to find shelter. Many, many are women and children. They're often sick, disoriented, suffering from substance abuse or mental health issues, and they're barely able to cope, cope with the stress, the insecurity, and the dangers they face every day. And while Ophelia's comments may be dismissed as the ramblings of a mentally ill woman, they speak to something much deeper about the current state of American society and its desertion of entire populations who are now considered the human waste of the neoliberal economic order. People who were once viewed as facing dire problems in need of state intervention and social protection are now seen as a problem threatening society. This becomes clear when the war on poverty is transformed into a war against the poor. When the plight of the homeless is defined less as a political and economic issue in need of social reform than as a matter of law and order. Or when government budgets for prison construction eclipse funds for higher education. Indeed, the transformation of the social state into the corporate control punishing state is made startling clear when young people, to rephrase W.E.B. Du Bois, become problem people rather than people who face problems. Young people, especially low income and poor minorities, are now viewed as trouble rather than being troubled. And as such, they're increasingly subject to the dictates of the criminal justice system rather than the recipients of assistance from social programs that could address their most basic needs. Beyond exposing the moral depravity of a society that fails to provide for its youth, the symbolic and real violence waged against young people reflects nothing, more than, nothing less than a collective death wish, especially visible when youth protest their conditions. As Elaine Beydou argues, we live in an era in which there is near zero tolerance for democratic resistance, an infinite intolerance for the crimes of bankers and government embezzlers, which affect the lives of millions. How else to explain the FBI's willingness to label as a terrorist threat youthful activists speaking against corporate and government misdeeds, while at the same time the Bureau refuses to press criminal charges against the banking giant HSBC for laundering billions of dollars for Mexican drug cartels and terrorist groups linked to Al-Qaeda. Equally, <laughs> equally disturbing are the revelations of the Department of Homeland Security, which was created in large part to combat terrorism, but has put under surveillance the members of the Black Lives Movement who have been organizing against the racist conditions producing police violence against blacks in America. If youth were once the repository of society's dreams, that's no longer true. Increasingly, young people are viewed as a public disorder, a dream now turned into a nightmare. Many youth are forced to negotiate a post-9-11 social order that positions them as a prime target for its governing through crime complex. Consider the many get tough policies that now render young people criminals while depriving them of basic health, education, and social services. Punishment and fear have replaced compassion and social responsibility as the most important modalities for mediating the relationship of youth to the larger society. All too evident by the upsurge of zero tolerance laws in schools along with the expanding reach of the punishing state in the United States. When the criminalization of social problems becomes a mode of governance and war its default strategy Youth are reduced to soldiers or targets, not social investments. As anthropologist Elaine Berto points out, youth is no longer considered the world's future, but a threat to its present. Increasingly, the only political discourses available to many young people derive from the privatized regimes of self-discipline and emotional self-management. Youth are now removed from any meaningful register of democracy. Their absence is symptomatic of a society that is turned against itself, punishes its children, and does so at the risk of crippling the entire body politic. What I call the war on youth emerged in its contemporary forms when the social contract, however compromised and feeble, came crashing to the ground 
around the time that Margaret Thatcher married Ronald Reagan. And they had twins, George Bush and Donald Trump. Both were hardline advocates of a market fundamentalism and announced respectively that there was no such thing as society and that government was the problem, not the solution to citizens' woes. Within a decade, democracy and the political process were hijacked by corporations that the call for austerity policies and the call became, not for austerity policies, became a kind of cheap copy for weakening the welfare state, public values, and public goods. And the result of this emerging neoliberal regime included a widening gap between, as we all know, the rich and the poor, a growing culture of cruelty, and a dismantling of social provisions. One result has been that the promise of youth has given way to an age of market-induced angst in a view of many young people as a drain on short-term investments and a threat to untrampled self-interest and quick profits. The war on youth is spreading out across the United States. How else to explain America's turning of schools into training centers, modeling many after prisons, or promoting in the name of educational reform the rise of pedagogies of repression, such as teaching to the test and high stakes testing? What's the role of education in a democracy when a society burdens an entire generation with high tuition costs and student loans. I think David Graeber is right in arguing, quote, student loans are destroying the imagination of youth. If there's a way for society to commit mass suicide, what better way than to take all the youngest, the most energetic, the creative, joyous people in our society and saddle them with a $50,000 debt so that they essentially end up being slaves? There goes your music. There goes your culture. We're in a society that has lost any ability to incorporate the interesting, the creative, and the eccentric people, except for Santa Fe. <laughs> <laughs> what he does not say is that many young people are also being depoliticized because they're struggling just to survive, not only materially, but also existentially. Under such circumstances, all bets are off regarding the future of democracy. And what is also being lost in the current historical conjuncture is the very idea of interpersonal responsibility, a commitment to the collective good, a democratic notion of the commons, the idea of connecting learning to social improvement and the promise of a robust democracy dedicated to a full measure of personal, economic, and social rights. Under a regime of a ruthless economic Darwinism, we are witnessing the crumbling of social bonds and the triumph of individual desires over social rights. Nowhere more exemplified than in the growth of civic illiteracy, gated minds in gated communities, simplistic intolerance, atrophied social skills, a culture of cruelty and a downward spiral, spiral into the dark recesses of an oligarchic social order. When Princeton University, that mecca of communist scholarship, <laughs> publishes a study in which they claim that the policies that have been made and produced over the last 50 years, 95% of them have nothing to do with the needs of the American people and conclude that we don't live in a democracy, but in an oligarchy, you know something's up. <laughs> Children pay most acutely for this. Consider that the United States is the only country in the world that has refused to ratify the United Nations Conventions for the Rights of the Child, which calls for such utterly uh, Marxist-oriented principles, such as a commitment to promote and respect the human rights of children, including the right to life, to health, to education, and to play, as well as the right to family life to be protected from violence and any form of discrimination. Truly a radical document. Truly something that the Homeland Security should look at. Politics is now driven by a much-promoted hyper-competitive ideology whose message 
is that surviving in society demands reducing social relations to a form of social combat. Too many young people today learn quickly that their fate is solely a matter of individual responsibility, irrespective of wider structural forces. And as such, politics becomes an extension of war, just as systemic economic insecurity and anxiety and state-sponsored violence increasingly find legitimation in the discourses of austerity, privatization, and demonization, which promote anxiety, moral panics, fear, and undermine any sense of communal responsibility for the well-being of others. The curse of privatization in a consumer-driven society is intensified by the market-driven assumption that for young people, the only obligation of citizenship is to consume. Yet, there's more at work than the mechanisms of depoliticization. There is also a flight from social responsibility, if not politics itself. Also lost is the importance of those social bonds, modes of collective reasoning, public spheres and cultural apparatuses crucial to the formation of what we might call a sustainable democratic society. As one eminent sociology points out, visions nowadays have fallen into disrepute, and we tend to be proud of what we should be ashamed of. For instance, politicians as, such as former Vice President Dick Cheney, truly the Darth Vader of our times, not only refuses to apologize for the events an immense misery, displacement, and suffering they've imposed on the Iraqi people, principally Iraqi children. They also seem to gloat in defending such policies. Doublespeak takes on a new register as President Obama employs the discourse of national security to sanction a surveillance state, a targeted assassination list, and the ongoing of young children and their families by drones. This expanding landscape of lies has not only produced an illegal and global war on terror, terror, justified state torture even on children, it has also provided a justica justification for the United States' slide into barbarism after the tragic events of 9-11. Yet, such acts of state violence appear to be of little concern to the shameless apostles of permanent war. In what follows, I want to address the intensifying assault on young people to the related concepts of the soft war and the hard war. The idea of the soft war considers the changing conditions of youth within the relentless expansion of a global market society. Partnered with a massive advertising industry, the soft war targets all children and youth, devaluing them by treating them as yet another market to be commodified and exploited and conscripting them into the system through relentless attempts to create a new generation of hyper-consumers. This low-intensity war is waged by a variety of corporate institutions through the educational force of a culture that commercializes every aspect of kids' lives and now uses the internet and various social networks along with the new media technologies such as smartphones to immerse young people in a world of mass consumption in ways that are more direct and more expansive than anything we have ever seen in the past. Commercially copied bomb by an advertising industry that in the United States spent $189 billion in 2012, the typical child is now exposed to about 40,000 ads a year, and by the time they reach the fourth grade, have memorized 300 to 400 brands. An entire generation is being drawn into a world of consumerism in which, cons in which commodities and brand loyalty become both the most important markers of identity and the primary frameworks for mediating one's relationship to the world. Increasingly, many young people recast as commodities can only recognize themselves in terms preferred by the market. And as the sociologist and my friend Sigmund Bauman points out, youth are simultaneously promoters of commodities and the commodities that they promote, defined as both brands and merchandise on one hand and as marketing agents on the other. What are the consequences of the soft war? Public spaces have been transformed into neoliberal disimagination zones, which makes it difficult for young people to find public spheres where they can locate themselves and translate metaphors of hope into meaningful action. The dreamscapes that make up society built on the promise of mass consumption translate deftly into ad copy, insistently promoting and normalizing a neoliberal order, 
in which economic relations now provide the master script for how young people define themselves, their relationships to others in the larger world. The data mining marketers, marketeers make young people think they count when in fact all they really want to do is count them. The dominant culture's overbearing ecology of consumption now works to selectively eliminate and reorder the possible modes of political, social, ethical vocabularies made available to youth. Young people's most private experiences are now colonized by a consumerist ethic that deforms their sense of agency, desires, values, and hopes. Trapped within a spectacle of marketing, their capacity to be critically engaged and socially responsible citizens, to say the least, is significantly compromised. The hard war is a more serious and dangerous development for young people, especially those who are marginalized by virtue of their ethnicity, their race, their gender, their sexuality, and class. The hard war refers to the harshest elements of a growing youth crime control complex that operates through the logic of punishment, <clears throat> surveillance, and control. The young people targeted by its punitive measures are often poor minority youth who are considered failed consumers and can only afford to live in the margins of a commercial culture that excludes anybody without money, resources, and leisure time. They're the youth considered uneducable and unemployable and therefore troublesome, if not a threat to the existing order. <clears throat> the imprint of the youth control, crime control complex can be traced to the now normative practice of organizing life in schools through disciplinary practices that subject students to constant surveillance through high-tech security devices, while imposing on them harsh and often thoughtless zero-tolerance policies that clearly resemble measures used by the criminal justice system. In this instance, poor and minority youth become objects of a new mode of governance based on the crudest forms of disciplinary control, punished if they don't show up at school and punished even if they do. Many, many of these students are funneled into what has been ominously called the school to prison pipeline. If middle and upper class kids are subject to the seductions of market driven public relations, working class youth are caught in the crosshairs between the arousal of commercial desire and the harsh impositions of securitization, surveillance, and policing. How else to explain the fact that in the United States today, 500,000 young people are incarcerated? and 2.5 million are arrested annually, and that by the age of 23, almost a third of Americans have been arrested for a crime. What kind of society allows 1.6 million to be homeless at any given time in society, or allows massive inequalities in wealth and income to produce a politically and morally dis dysfunctional society in which 45% of US residents live in ho households that struggle to make ends meet? What would you make of a society in which more young people were killed on the streets of Chicago since 2001 than were American soldiers killed in Afghanistan? To be more exact, 5,000 people were killed by gunfire in Chicago, many of them children, while 2,000 troops were killed between 2001 and 12. What kind of society is indifferent to the fact that this country sees an average of 92 gun deaths per day, with more preschoolers shot dead each year than police officers are killed in the line of duty? Near weekly mass shootings aside, what has flown under the radar is that in the last four years, 500 children, more than 500 children under the age of 12 were killed by guns. As the war on terror comes home, public spaces have been transformed into war zones as local police forces have taken on the role of an occupying army, especially in poor minority neighborhoods accentuated by the fact that the police have now access to armored troop carriers, night vision rifles, Humvees, M16 automatic ref, uh, rifles, grenade launchers, and other weapons designed for military, for military tactics. Acting as a paramilitary, paramilitary force, many local police have become a new sim symbol of domestic terrorism, shaking down minority youth in black communities in general by criminalizing a multitude of behaviors. This was especially true in the stop and frisk policies so widespread under former mayor Michael, Bloom Michael Bloomberg in New York City. In Ferguson, Missouri, the entire population 
was subject to a form of legal lawlessness in what can only be described as a practice of racist extortion. Rather than defined as a population to be protected, the largely black citizens of Ferguson were arrested and fined for being unable to pay their debts, for violating a trivial, trivial rule such as letting their grass grow too high, jaywalking, all of which made them a prime target for the criminal justice system and a source of revenue. And as a result, the police viewed the black residents of Ferguson as potential targets for what can only be described as a shakedown operation. The rise of the punishing state and the war on terror has emboldened, a poli emboldened police forces across the nation and in doing so feeds their use of racist violence against young people resulting in what has been called an epidemic of police brutality. Sadly, even minority children have not been immune from such violence such as you well know, the killing of 12-year-old Tamir Rice on November 22nd, 2014, by a white policeman, which of course, it was, uh, by a killing by a white policeman, and this has become clear, this type of violence as a result of this. Even more tragic is the fact that the city of Cleveland tried to blame the boy for his own death. Imagine, he was holding a BB gun when he was shot to death by a policeman judged unfit for duty just two years prior. The killing of black youth and adults has taken on the image of a cruel sport, suggestive of a police force spiraling downward into a form of authoritarianism that merges lawlessness with a dangerous force for what I call a form of militarism. Against the idealistic rhetoric of a government that claims to venerate young people lies the reality of a society that increasingly views youth through the topic of law and order a society that appears all too willing to treat youth as criminals and when necessary to disappear them into the farthest reaches of the carceral state. What do we make of a society that allows a New York, the New York City police to come into a school, arrest and handcuff and haul off a 12-year-old student for doodling on a desk? Or for that matter, school systems that allow a six-year-old in Georgia and a five-year-old in kinder kindergarten pupil in Florida to be handcuffed and taken to, police station, to the police station for having a tantrum in the classroom? Where's the public outrage when two police officers are called to a daycare center in central Indiana to handle an alleged unruly 10-year-old and decide to taser the child? Or when school administrations, the school administration allows a police officer in Arkansas to use a stun gun to dis discipline an allegedly out of control 10 year old girl. One public response to this incident came from Steve Tuttle, a spokesman for Taser International Incorporated, who insisted, quote, stun guns can be used safely on children. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Sadly, this is but a small sampling of the ways in which children are being punished instead of educated in American schools, especially inner city schools. All of these examples point, point to the, social, the growing social disregard for young people and the number of institutions willing to employ crime and punishment measures that together constitute not only a crisis of education, but the emergence of a new mode of politics that Jonathan Simon has called governing through crime. Of course, we've seen this ruthless crime optic in previous historical periods. But at least crime was followed by attempts at reforms and rehabilitation, not revenge, as characterizes the contemporary justice system. For one historical example of this broader understanding of crime and punishment, I want to turn to Claude Brown, the late African-American novelist who understood something about this war on youth in its mid-century articulation. Through his novel, Man Child, Though his novel, Man Child in the Promised Land, takes place in Harlem in the 50s and the 60s, there's something to be learned from his autobiographical work. Take, for example, the following passage. <clears throat> if Reno was in a bad mood, if he didn't have any money and he wasn't high, he'd say, man, Sonny, they ain't got no kids in Harlem. I ain't never seen any. I've seen some real people acting like kids but they don't have any kids in Harlem because nobody has time for childhood. Man, do you remember being a kid? Not me, shit. Kids are happy, kids laugh, kids are secure. They ain't scared of nothing. You ever been a kid? Sonny, 
damn, you're lucky. I ain't never been a kid, man. I don't remember being happy and not scared. I don't know what happened, man, but I think I missed out on that childhood thing because I don't ever recall being a kid. In Man Child and the Promised Land, Claude Brown wrote about the doomed lives of his friends, his families, and neighborhood acquaintances. The book is mostly remembered as a brilliant but devastating portrait of Harlem under siege, a community ravaged and broken by heroin, poverty, unemployment, crime, and police brutality. But what Brown really made visible was that raw violence and dead-end existence that plagued so many young people in Harlem, stole not only their future, but their childhood as well. And in the midst of the social collapse and the psychological trauma wrought by systemic fusions of racism and class exploita exploitation, children in Harlem were held hostage to forces that robbed them of the innocence that comes with childhood and forced them to take on the risk and burdens of daily sub survival that older generations were unable to shield them from. But at the heart of Brown's narrative, written in the midst of the civil rights struggle in the 1960s is a man-child, a metaphor that indicts a society that is waging war on those children who are black and poor and are forced to grow up too quickly. The hybridized concept of man-child marked a liminal space in which innocence was lost and childhood stolen. In any meaningful sense of adult agency and autonomy were aggressively compromised. Harlem was a well-contained internal colony, and its street life provided the conditions for the very necessity for insurrection. But the many forms of rebellion young people expressed, from the public and the progressive to the interiorized and self-destructive, came at a cost, which Brown reveals near the end of the book. Quote, it seemed as though most of the cats that we'd come up with just hadn't made it, and everybody was dead or in jail. Childhood was stolen. Child, childhood stolen was not to be salvaged by self-help, that short-sighted and mendacious appeal that would define the reactionary reform efforts of Margaret Thatcher's children, Reagan and so forth, in the 80s and 90s. From Reagan's hatred of government to Clinton's attack on welfare reform and his instrumental role in creating one of the world's largest prison systems. At that time, it was a clarion call for condemning a social order that denied children a viable and life-enhancing present and future. And while Brown approached everyday life in Harlem more as a poet than as a political revolutionary, politics was embedded in every sentence of his book, not a politics mocked by demagoguery and hatred and orthodoxy, but one that made visible the damage done by a social system characterized by massive inequalities and a, raci a rigid racial divide. Manchild created the image of a society without children in order to raise questions about the future of a country that had turned its back on its most vulnerable population. And like the great critical theorist C. Wright Mills, Claude Brown's lasting contribution was to reconfigure the boundaries between public issues and private suffering. For Brown, racism was about power and oppression, not simply ignorance, not fear, and could not be separated from broader social, economic, and political considerations. Rather than denying systemic causes of injustice, he insisted that social forces had to be factored into any understanding of both group suffering and individual despair. Brown explored the suffering of the young in Harlem, but he did so by utterly refusing to privatize it or to dramatize and spectacularize private life over public dysfunction or to separate individual hopes, desires, and agency from the realm of politics and public life, if I may say so. Any democracy that loses its ability to translate private issues into public concerns its inability to translate isolated issues into larger systemic considerations loses its ability to be a democracy. That's the educational center at the heart of a politics that matters.
That's the progressive moment in which questions of raising consciousness, enlisting people's points of identification, making the personal political in a broader sense, it seems to me has an enormous currency for the time in which we live. The plight of poor minority youth also extends beyond the severity of material deprivations and the violence they experience daily. Many young people have been forced to view the world and redefine the nature of their own, their own youth within the borders of hopelessness, insecurity, and despair. There is little basis on which to imagine a better future lying beyond the highly restrictive spaces of commodification and containment. Neoliberal austerity and social spending means an entire generation of youth will not have access to decent jobs. The material comforts, educational opportunities, or the security available to previous generations. These are a new generation of youth who have to think, act, and like, and talk like adults, worry about their families, which may be headed by a single parent or two, out of work and searching for a job, or abandoned in the vast now carceral system, the punishing state. In the United States, young people are further burdened by the registers of extreme poverty that pose the dire challenge of food security and access to even the most basic health care in communities ravaged by those illnesses and special needs that accrue in impoverished conditions. Educators, individuals, artists, intellectuals, and various social movements need to make visible both the workings of a market fundamentalism in all of its forms of exploitation, whether personal, political, or economic, and they need to reconstruct a platform and set up strategies to oppose it. Clearly, any political formation that matters must challenge the savage, savage cost of casino capitalism that, has, that casino, casino capitalism has enacted and worked to undo the forms of social, political, and economic violence that young people are daily experiencing. This will demand more than one day demonstrations. Urgently needed a new public spheres in which there's a resurgence of public memory, civic literacy, civic courage. That is, a willingness to both effectively analyze the structures and mechanisms of capitalist power and other forms of authoritarianism to formulate a sophisticated political response and the willingness to build long-standing oppositional movements. Traces of such movements are beginning to emerge in the United States among fast food workers, students protesting crushing debt and police brutality and the ongoing development of social movements in countries such as Spain and Greece that are rejecting the harsh neoliberal austerity policies imposed by the bankers and the global financial elites. In North America, we're seeing important though inconclusive attempts on the part of young people to break the whole of unaccountable government and financial power. And this was evident in the Occupy movement, the Quebec student movement, the I Don't Know More movement, and the recent Black Lives movement. The New York Times recently reported that people all over the world are losing faith in democracy. What they missed is that young people are not, are not dissatisfied with democracy, but with its absence. In the United States, there is a new political momentum to reclaim democracy, a real democracy one that provides all Americans with a livable minimum wage or guaranteed income, removes money from politics, reclaims the commons by reversing the pernicious nature of privatization, reigns in the ravaging effects of unfettered casino capitalism, abolishes the bogus concept of corporate personhood, dismantles the permanent warfare state, reverses global warming, redistributes wealth in the interest of a vibrant democracy, nationalizes health care, breaks up the banks, eliminates the punishing mass incarceration state, and eradicates the surveillance state, among many others. This is a language that says no society is ever just enough and calls for a new collective struggles in the hope of creating a future that refused, refuses to be defined by the dystopian forces now shaping American society. <laughs>
These reforms are both profound and instructive for the times in which we live because they point to the need to think beyond the given, to think beyond the distorted market-based hope offered to us by the advocates of casino capitalism. Such thinking rooted in the radical imagination is the central goal of civic education, which in the words of poet Robert Haas, is to refresh the idea of justice which is going dead in us all the time. Too many progressives and people in the left are stuck in the discourses of foreclosure and cynicism and need to develop what my friend, late friend Stuart Hall called a sense of politics being educative, of politics changing the way people see things. There's a need for educators, young people, artists, and other cultural workers to develop both a language of critique and a language of hope in which people can address the historical structure, structural and ideological conditions at the core of the violence being waged by the corporate and repressive state. The issue of who gets to define the future, share the nation's wealth, shape the parameters of the social state, steward and protect the globe's resources, and create a formative culture for producing engaged and socially responsible citizens is not a rhetorical issue. This challenge offers up new categories for defining how matters of representations, education, economic justice, and politics are being defined and fought over. This is a difficult task, but we are seeing in cities such as New York, Athens, Quebec, Paris, Madrid, and other sites of massive inequality throughout the world, there is a beginning of a long struggle for the institutions, the values, and the infrastructures that make communities a center of robust, radical democracy. We live at a time in which it's more crucial than ever to imagine a future that does not repeat the present. Given the urgency of the problems that we face, I think it's all the more crucial to take seriously the challenge of Jacques Derrida's provocation. We must do and think the impossible. If only the possible happened, nothing more would happen. If I only did what I can do, I wouldn't do anything. My friend, my close friend, the late Howard Zinn got it right in his insistence that hope is the willingness to hold out, even in times of pessimism, the possibility of surprise. Or, if, I'm, if I may add to this eloquent plea, history is open, and the space of the possible is larger than the one on display. Thank you. <laughs>